thank you for the invitation. Always nice to come back to Imperial College. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, what says there, I guess, waste to wealth using green chemistry. Green chemistry is a term you may have come across. I realise this is a mixed audience in terms of academic backgrounds. It's not going to be very chemistry, so don't worry. I, won't, I will have some chemical structures, but not too many. I mean, the emphasis really, although it's called green chemistry, I often think the, uh, the name's a bit deceptive because it's chemistry, it actually covers an awful lot of things. And, um, and one of the things I've had to learn to do, and my colleagues similarly, has been to learn how to be genuinely multidisciplinary. And I'll mention at the end of my talk some of the networks we're involved in, some of the international networks, and we are, and they are deliberately designed to bring in not just other scientists and engineers, but also, you know, lawyers and economists and social scientists and all sorts of people, um, at, which, of course, given the nature of this institute, I'm sure you'll all be uh, familiar with. So, anyway, it's, um, I've got the title Waste to Wealth because, uh, well, you'll kind of hopefully see why I often talk now in that, on that theme. Um, it is something which is becoming quite serious now. I started talking about waste as a, as a resource a few years ago and often got a lot of blank reactions especially in certain parts of the world. Uh, I noticed the trend is definitely changing. I was in a meeting yesterday in, um, in, uh, with, some, with some people from DEFRA and Biz, and I was sitting next to a guy from a waste company, basically, Veolia. You may know Veolia is probably Europe's largest waste company. And by coincidence, I'd also been talking to other people from Veolia quite recently. And he kind of confirmed, which is what I was sensing, which was the waste world is changing. There is definitely a change in attitude about waste. And so hopefully what I'm going to talk about now is not going to be too alien, too odd, but will actually, um, will actually start to make sense. What I want to do is kind of um, spend about half my talk talking about the sort of drivers, you know, the things that I think are the most important reasons why I think green chemistry in its broader sense is important and why I think this particular concept of waste to wealth is, is so relevant. And then in the second half of my talk, I'll just give a few case studies of projects we're running um, I won't go into them in great depth, um, but just to give you an idea of the kinds of things we're doing. The center, by the way, at York now has the best part of 100 people. We moved into a new building last year, which allowed us to really come together. So it's now quite a large effort. Uh, we have our own scale-up lab, which I'll mention again later. And as I also implied, all sorts of networks reaching all over the world, doing all sorts of different things. But it's all driven really by the fact that we are all as a chemist, I can be kind of proud and say, well, you know, uh, as a chemist, I manipulate chemicals, I make chemicals, I make compounds, and those chemicals are useful everywhere. And it's, uh, it's always fun. Uh, so as an academic, uh, I can kind of stand above all the uh, different sectors, and so I can talk to people who make, who make food or make pharmaceuticals or make mobile phones or whatever. You know, I mean, all of these things need chemicals. <coughs> And I can talk to all those groups, and I'm considered to be kind of separate. I'm not, I'm not too biased in what I talk about, at least in terms of the sector. And they all present interesting challenges. They're all kind of dependent on chemicals, yes. They're all beginning at different, in different levels to think about the chemicals they need more than they have done before. And that's something I've been very keen on, because in the past, if you talk to people who say made uh, furniture, then you wouldn't get a lot of reaction if you started talking about chemicals or chemistry. Even people in personal care products, they didn't really react to this. People in food didn't really, clothing and so on. A lot of these sectors didn't see themselves as being connected to chemicals, even though I would say, yeah, but everything you make and sell, or everything you sell in the case of retailers, depends upon chemicals. But they didn't really react to that until the good old legislation came along. And legislation, of course, is the driver for so many changes in society. And the legislation, which has been, I'll come back to again in a moment, which has been really forcing people to rethink the chemistry and the chemicals that are used, is beginning to make all of these sectors wake up to the fact that actually, you know, they are dependent on these things called chemicals, which have complicated supply chains going all over the world which actually are not as simple as it seems, which actually are not as guaranteed as it seems, which are not as secure as maybe they'd like them to be. So all sorts of interesting things there. And also, wherever you look, you get different challenges. So one of our biggest projects is around pharmaceuticals, and that industry has always been very closely connected to the chemicals world because most pharmaceuticals are still chemical entities, and they need synthesizing by very complicated, rather wasteful routes. So they've always been interested in trying to do things more efficiently, more cleanly, more greenly, if you like. So that's 
and that continues to be a big, a big subject. And in that particular industry, the driver for change from the industry has been about what I just said, which is improving efficiency. So the average resource efficiency for making pharmaceuticals is about 1%. So in other words, they make about 100 times as much waste as they do product. So for obvious reasons, they want to improve on that. So that's the big driver there. So we're involved in a big innovative medicines initiative project, a big pan-European project, the biggest of its kind. And that's very much focused on manufacturing. But of course, there's also another interesting angle on this, which is pharmaceuticals in the environment, often called PI which is an emerging, well, I say emerging, it's been known and appreciated for many years, but seems to be getting more public recognition than perhaps was the case a few years ago. And that's also, interestingly, triggered a new innovative medicines initiative project, which starts later this year, I believe, which is focusing very much on the pharmaceuticals at the end of their life and what they're doing in the environment. So, you know, the range of concerns there are perhaps broader than they were a few years ago. The one in the middle there is interesting because I had no appreciation really of what roads were. I mean, I drive on them like most people do, but I didn't really think about roads until I was approached just last year by somebody from an organization called Colas. And I'm really, I mean, anybody here heard of Colas? I mean, Colas is the world's largest road construction company. I've never heard of them. They're French, they're enormous. And uh, I was approached by somebody who said, we'd like to talk about green chemistry. And I thought, okay and went along, and one of the things I did was go to their company and talk to their scientists. And I learned as much as they learned, I think, because I learned about, you know, the chemistry that goes into roads. And there's a lot of chemistry that goes into roads. And their concern was very much resource orientated. Um, and they're kind of interesting because they are the ones that use the last stuff that comes out of a refinery. So, you know, I'll be talking about, and many people in this area talk about biorefineries, future biorefineries, you know, how we're going to be using biomass as a feedstock for energy and chemicals and materials. The traditional petroleum refinery, although it's, of course, got a fundamental problem about not having a sustainable feedstock, it is incredibly efficient. And even when they get down to the horrible black sticky stuff at the end that nobody else wants, the road industry comes along and says, we'll have that. And that's what they basically make roads from. So actually thinking of future biorefineries, and you know, when you're processing biomass, you know, there's always gonna be stuff at the end that you don't know what to do with. Well, there you go, it's gonna be the road industry. And actually there is some logic to that as well. So their concern is very much about the feedstock. But depending on where you are, I mean, I'll just mention one more because they're all interesting, but all different. I'll mention one more because most of you, all of you probably have flown an aircraft before. And this presents a particular challenge, not for necessarily the reasons you might think of, but to do with current legislation around chemicals. Because every aircraft that I'm aware of is, is designed uh, using um, interface chemistry, which occurs between the plastic and the aluminium frame. So modern aircraft are actually, although you might not think so, they're actually quite fuel efficient. They're certainly more fuel efficient than if they were made from something else. So the fact that they're quite lightweight is very important for fuel efficiency. But it's also rather important when you're 30,000 feet in the air to be confident the wing's going to stay together. Well, the wing stays together because of the interface, interface chemistry between the plastic and the, the organic plastic and the inorganic metal frame. And that's not a trivial, that, tr that science is quite complicated. And the one thing that works to make those two stick together is chromate, chromium-6. Well, of course, chromate, not surprisingly, chromium-6 has been one of the very first chemicals which has been targeted under modern chemical legislation. So there's an interesting dilemma around that, you know. Do you want to be safe at 30,000 feet or do you want to be, you know, stick to the legislation and concern yourself with the people having to work with chromates to actually build the aircraft? There's a rather interesting fact about this, which is Boeing. So in the United States, chromate has always been banned for some time in every state except where Boeing are. So wherever Boeing are, conveniently, the legislation is relaxed. But, you know, given the the cost benefit, if you like, maybe you think that's worthwhile. So wherever you are, there's interesting uh, challenges uh, looking forward. And of course, we also face the challenge in terms of the actual nature of chemicals themselves and the fact that people don't like chemicals. Um, it's rather alarming when you look at the uh, surveys. So the Chemical Industry Association for many years have carried out surveys of the general public and asked them, what do you think about chemical manufacturing? Um, and put it alongside other industries and just make comparisons. And for a long time, chemical manufacturing has only had, there's only been two industries which actually have been less popular among the general public, and they've been tobacco and nuclear. 
you know, so it's kind of, ooh, you know, we're really down there with the bad guys. Only about one in four people thought chemicals, think chemical manufacturing is a good thing. So they don't make the connection I've just showed you between the things they want and actually, you know, the, the chemicals that go into them. And of course, you know, when there is news about chemicals, it's often very bad. This is a long time ago, but it's still very, very important. There's an, a lot of lessons to be learned about what happened at Bhopal. If you don't know about Bhopal, Google search it. You know, it's, it's a really important case study. I mean, say important, it cost thousands of people their lives. It was a real incident, which was, you know, I mean, I guess the key lessons to learn from that, now that we have the benefit of hindsight, is in particular about storage. So nobody really believes that you can, ca you can do future chemistry without handling hazardous substances. It's, it's inevitable. I mean, everything is hazardous in certain ways. So really, you know, to get the benefit of society, which I mentioned before, you're going to have to get used to the fact we will have to handle hazardous substances. But that doesn't mean to say that you need to increase the risk because it's all about exposure. And if you minimize exposure, then the hazard shouldn't be so important. Now, this was a classic example of how not to minimize exposure. Because what they were doing, what Union Carbide were doing was, they were making a very hazardous chemical and they were storing it in very large tanks right next to a high population area. And, you know, as things happened, of course, there was an accident, there was a leak. Some of it escaped, thousands of people died. And even now, there's still all sorts of hereditary consequences of that, uh, that disaster. So that taught us a lot, but also taught us, and it was around about that time that these surveys started to show how badly people thought about chemicals. There may be a coincidence there. I don't think it was entirely coincidental. But certainly it made us, um, it made us more aware of the fact that, you know, by, if you handle chemicals, you're taking a risk, and you need to very much reduce that risk as best you can. And remember to reduce risk, there's two ways to reduce risk. One is to reduce the hazards of the substances you're handling. So as I said before, chromate, chromium-6 is hazardous. So if we can find a more benign way of doing what we need it to do, great. And the other is to minimize exposure. And that means, for example, you shouldn't let hazardous chemicals get into the sorts of articles that the general public handle. If you are doing it in a factory, it should be well away from population zones, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all sorts of interests. I, I remember a few years ago going to see a, a new chemical plant in Sicily. And, uh, and it was quite funny because, in a way, some of the people who were showing me this plant were quite excited because they were saying, it's great because, you know, people don't have to travel very far. So here's where we've built all this accommodation for the workers to live. And on the other side of the road, here's the chemical plant. Well, the chemical plant included an enormous cylinder of chlorine, you know, and it was like, well, you know, <laughs> if there's a rupture there, then you're going to have a big problem. So, not terribly well thought through. So when these things happen, as I say, you know, governments react, we get legislation, and in terms of chemical legislation, we have seen this exponential growth since around about the time of, well, Bhopal was around here, a bit earlier than that, we've seen this big growth in legislation. And legislation affecting chemicals, there has been some. You can go all the way back to, gosh, I mean, you know, some of the earliest legislation goes back to the days, into the 19th century, around, um, around all sorts of, uh, you know, case of mining incidents, you know, mining which was causing all sorts of waste issues that had to be controlled. We had the Clean Air Act, all sorts of things were going on there. But when you get here, there's been this dramatic growth in legislation affecting chemicals, because, as I said, people have been concerned about chemicals. And we've also now got this, you know, this legislation here. Again, if you don't know it, do, do search it, because I think this is the most important chemical legislation the world's ever seen. And I'm not just saying that because I'm European and this is European legislation, because REACH, although it's European, there's now a Korea REACH, there's a Japanese REACH, the Chinese are looking at versions of REACH. You get something very similar going on in parts of the United States, et cetera, et cetera. REACH, which is Registration, Evaluation, Authorization of Chemicals, for the first time says something which most people assumed always was happening, which was that every chemical we work with in significant quantities, like more than one ton a year, needs to be properly tested. Is it hazardous? What it comes down to, really. Back to, you know, minimizing risk. So, in, in reality, we know very little about most of the chemicals we use in terms of the hazards they present to us and to the environment. REACH is designed to change that, so great. You know, that fundamentally is a very important thing to do. The consequences of REACH are, we don't know yet. Um, it's happening, you know, so the first substances which have been put forward 
so-called substances of very high concern for REACH to be looking at are just beginning to work their way through the system now. So things like chromates I mentioned before have now been targeted and identified under REACH as substances we should stop using. Now, there's a lot of detail in what that means, but in reality, it's going to be very difficult, for example, to start a new process in Europe involving chromates. And it's not just chromates. The list of chemicals being affected by this is very large. But being European, legislation, of course, it's great, but it's very slow. So it's going to be the end of the decade before we even get close, I suspect, to actually having all the data we need to properly assess all the chemicals we use. <coughs> so, of course, what's happened is that NGOs have been really pushing this, of course, very hard from when it was first being considered like almost 10 years ago. They are now coming up with alternatives. They're coming up with kind of pre-reach stuff. So there's an organization called ChemSec, uh, which is probably Europe's most important chemical-related NGO. And I had a breakfast meeting with one of the ChemSec people yesterday. And ChemSec have issued something they call the SIN list, the Substitute It Now list. And again, you can look it up on the web. And what they've done is they targeted about 500 chemicals they say probably will be subject to bans or similar under reach. But obviously, they don't have a full data set. So they're basing it to some extent on kind of read across and all sorts of things. So it's very controversial. And they've just announced they're extending that list even further. So it's, it's a bit of a mess at the moment in terms of, you know, what people think will be or will not be allowed chemicals for the future. But what is clear, going back to what I said before, is that everybody in all the sectors that now recognize they need chemicals are beginning to get a bit nervous because they're thinking, OK, so, you know, so now they're saying we can't use cobalt compounds. So where are my supply chains? May they be using cobalt compounds? I don't use cobalt compounds, but somebody who manufactures something that I buy in might use cobalt compounds. So if they can't do the chemistry to make the thing that I want, so all this kind of thinking is going on, which I think is good because it makes them think about their supply chains in a way that didn't happen before. So legislation ultimately is having a big, big impact, but it's not perfect. I just wanted to give you one case study of why it's not perfect, and that's because the legislation reach is very much focused on the product, on the chemical. It doesn't think about how it was made. My concern is that people will say, ah, OK, um, I can't use this chemical anymore. I'll use this one because it doesn't seem to have any restrictions on its use. But how that chemical was made, where, what resource it was used, where that resource was harvested, was mined, under what circumstances, is not considered under each which to me is very limited in that case. And here's one example I just wanted to give you of where legislation, I think, is inadequate. It's parallel legislation about chemicals called Restriction on Hazardous Substances. This was actually a bit older than REACH, and it's all based around the idea that there are certain chemicals that used to be used in electronics that shouldn't be in the future. And I'm sure most people would agree that mercury and cadmium and lead and our friend chromium, again, chromates, probably better if we don't have them in... Are, you know, the devices we're using ourselves, as I said, you know, the worst, the worst possible situation with exposure. So, OK, let's ban those. And then Europe generally, which, of course, is, again, the, the pioneer on this sort of legislation, also says, and we're a bit worried about some other things. They don't like halogens in Europe. They're very anti-halogen. But they look at others that are commonly used, and they say they're OK. And there's one of them there, which I just wanted to mention as an example. That's tantalum. Tantalum is uh, used in... I think just about every mobile phone on the planet. You probably heard this morning about Apple announcing the largest profits ever reported by a company and how many mobile phones the iPhone 6 says. So I've got an iPhone 6, they're great, you know? Did you know that the iPhone 6 has got over 60 different elements in there? Over 60. That's more than half the periodic table in an iPhone 6. Ten years ago or so, it was around 20. And I'll come back to that point in a moment, because that's interesting and significant. But let me just finish this one off first. So tantalum appears to be OK, according to REACH-type legislation. Itself doesn't present any serious health problems. But how do they get tantalum? Well, the answer is, in a rather horrendous process, which starts with ore, which they mine nowadays in Central Africa, I believe, where, in fact, the environment, local environment, has been devastated. They then process it with a combination of sulfuric acid and hydrogen fluoride. Now, I was a fluorine chemist once, and believe me, HF is not nice, you know? And then later on, they've got molten sodium. They've got some VOC. This looks like the devil's chemistry kit. It's extraordinarily horrible. And this is going on. Nobody thinks about this. Well, they don't think, because all they're worried about is getting the tantalum out to make their electronic products, their next mobile phone. So 
you know, be careful about legislation which appears to label things as being okay when there's an awful lot of stuff to worry about, maybe a bit hidden. Now, chemical manufacturing on the whole is, is a problem. This gives you some data for the efficiency. I mentioned pharmaceuticals before down here. This is the number to look at. And this is basically saying how much waste we make compared to product. Pharmaceuticals, it can easily be only 1% resource efficiency. Fine chemicals, bulk chemicals. Oil refining, back to the good old petroleum refinery, good old, you know. As an example of efficiency, it's very, very good. There's not a lot of waste in the processing of oil to make chemicals. But generally, chemical manufacturing, as you add value, so what you're doing, of course, is you're taking hydrocarbons at the moment, you're processing them, you're then turning them into higher value chemicals by adding functions like oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and so on. And then the more complication you add, the higher the value until you get to really complicated molecules like pharmaceuticals or liquid crystals and that kind of thing. Now, the functionality's got very complicated. The waste has got really high. So the higher the value, the more complicated what you're making, the more waste you're making, the lower the efficiency. So overall, you know, you're making a lot of waste from starting off with something really simple like hydrocarbons. <coughs> Which, by the way, is I think, I think future generations will look back and think we were totally mad because, you know, in a way what we do is we wait for nature to turn all these wonderfully complicated substrates into something simple like hydrocarbons and then we take them out of the ground and then we make them really complicated again. And it's like, you know, it doesn't, doesn't sound terribly intelligent to me. And of course, we end up making a lot of waste. And the waste is not really, um, you probably know about as much about this as I do, the waste is uh, not really looked after. This is the waste management policies of different, they call it a policy, of different European countries and uh, USA and Japan. Uh, in Eastern Europe, they're still putting virtually everything in a hole in the ground. Uh, Japan is, if you like, the more interesting. You can debate about whether that's good or bad, but... They don't have much land, of course, so they're not putting so much in the hole in the ground. UK is about half goes into holes. Actually, this number is now beginning to go down. That's interesting. And that's because of tax. Landfill tax is beginning to bite. And so it is forcing people into being a bit more imaginative than putting things into a hole in the ground. So that's encouraging. It doesn't, it's a bit end of pipe. It doesn't solve the problem of how you should have made your manufacturing more efficient in the first place. But given the fact there's always going to be some other stuff that you make that you weren't aiming to make, then that sounds as though it might be encouraging. Right, now, not a lot of recycling either. So this is looking at the periodic table and looking at various elements and just trying to identify which of those we currently do recycle. In other words, when we've thrown something away, like a mobile phone or whatever it is, do we get the value back again? Well, the answer is not a lot. I mean, the only things we really recycle significantly are these ones here. And, of course, you know, platinum, palladium, silver, and so on. I mean, there, of course, I mean, gold, we just didn't have the full data for gold, but gold will be in there as well. We recycle those because we have done for many years. We consider them to be valuable, you know. Psychologically, we think of them as being valuable. Strangely, even more valuable elements that we uh, actually, like indium, we don't consider to be so valuable. So these, of course, are the heart of electronics, as are some of the ones down here I mentioned before. We just don't use them. We just don't recycle them. So, you know, at the moment, indium, which is put into, again, is very commonly used in most electronic devices, it, uh, most of it's going into a landfill site, which is not very clever because it's going to run out. And according to the data that we've got, I'll show you later, it's going to run out pretty quickly. These are the rare earths you've probably heard about. They're very controversial because most of the rare earths at the moment are um, in China. And again, you see, we're not recycling them. You know, there's hardly any recycling going on for most of the elements which we are using in large quantities every day for making the sorts of things that I showed you a moment ago. Waste, I won't dwell on this, it's just telling you waste is a problem, it's expensive, it's difficult to deal with. Now, just extending the previous slide on, on the periodic table, let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. So we're not recycling a lot of the things we use, how much do we have available of the various things that we use? So this is different to the slide I showed you before. This is actually the same periodic table, of course, but it's now telling us about the availability of those elements. So here again, the electronics industry, very much centered around here. And according to the data that's the best data available, less than 50 years of these elements are known. Now, when I say known, what that means is based on known reserves and current rate of consumption. 
By the way, the data is incredibly dynamic. This is already out of date, but it gives you an idea. So I won't stand, you know, I won't defend individual elements because I know the situation is always changing. For example, uh, lithium, which is being used more and more in batteries, probably deserves to be a darker colour. In other words, it's probably more of a problem than that would suggest. There's the rare earths again I mentioned before. And remember that most of those are coming out of China, so there is a geopolitical issue here as well. Now, the rare earths, by the way, they're not really that rare, or maybe they're becoming rare, but it's interesting to see their use profile because the use profile of these elements is changing. So Apple making uh, all that money from selling more and more phones, the, the downside on that, of course, is that means a lot of these elements are running out even more quickly. Um, Low-carbon technologies, which on the whole, you know, sound like a good thing to do, haven't been intelligently thought out in all cases. <coughs> so I mentioned lithium for batteries, and also rare earths go into wind turbines and hybrid cars and so on. People didn't think, you know, they haven't, there hasn't been a lot of intelligent substitution or intelligent new technologies going on. So what we're doing is we're now creating a much wider problem with regards to the availability of resources going forward. And this is being taken really seriously now. So if you go into Brussels, there's a lot of talk about this. People are genuinely concerned. We've now got lists being published of critical elements, things which are considered to be essential to the European economy, but which are running out, which we don't have ourselves. Europe is very poor when it comes to natural resources. We have silver, we've got copper. There's a few things we've got, but an awful lot of these things we don't have. Well, I say we don't have. We don't have them in the traditional sense of having natural ores, which are easily available. I mean, you know, ores are just metals which migrate up through the surface, through the earth onto the surface where we can process them. So easily available. They're just not there in Europe. But they are there in landfill sites. You know, we've got them. It's just we put them into very difficult places to get them out of. So, I, again, I suspect, you see, jumping ahead to the theme of my talk, that people will look at the waste that we have at the moment, we call waste at the moment, rather differently as time progresses. What I didn't show, that was interesting there, by the way, was, of course, the one thing that isn't shaded in any way is carbon. So carbon is not, as, as a, in a general sense, about known reserves, is not actually a major problem in the sense that it's there, but of course the issue around carbon is more to do with what carbon we use and how we use it that's the real issue. And of course, as I've already said, traditional chemical manufacturing is based on the petroleum feedstock industry. 90 plus percent of all the chemicals we use come from this route. It's incredibly efficient, as I mentioned before. It hasn't been there forever. It's going to be a hundred year-ish phenomenon probably. I mean, this has to be the century of change. If the last century was predominantly the petrochemical century, the 21st century has to be a phase change away from this because you just can't carry on. I mean, the oil that we're discovering is getting tougher and tougher to get. Okay, you've got things like shale gas coming through, which is certainly complicating or distracting anyway. But in reality, when we discover new sources of oil, they get tougher, they get economically more expensive, they get environmentally more challenging. The Gulf of Mexico, you know, I had two good friends, both of whom were very involved in BP in the Gulf of Mexico. And interestingly, talking to them afterwards over a few beers, you know, when they started to tell a few home truths, they admitted that, you know, BP had learned an awful lot from this. Well, they thought they had anyway, maybe not so from recent announcements. But, you know, hopefully, anyway, some of them anyway recognize that actually that was a real learning experience for them, that future oil is going to get tougher and tougher to get. And it's going to, you know, the issue, there's going to be all sorts of disasters associated with it. So really, there's all sorts of reasons why we've got to move away from this industry. Now, to me, it means, as I just said already, that, you know, we need to be thinking about the waste that we've just been saying is a massive problem because of inefficiency in manufacturing and so on, filling up landfill sites, etc. That has to be the future resource, or a future resource. And the type of waste that could be, obviously, I've been talking about electronics, but you've also got municipal solid waste, forestry waste, and a lot of food waste. And I'm going to talk a bit more now about food waste because that's something I've got very interested in in the last few years and I think it's very, very interesting and potentially very important. <coughs> and a lot of this comes into what we now talk about as the circular economy. That's an expression which has appeared almost from nowhere. Well, it was around, but it's suddenly become very popular now. So again, a lot of initiatives coming out of Brussels and elsewhere now talk about the circular economy. Very interesting. And that really is saying what I'm saying, which is that we can't carry on with a linear model of, you know, mine, process, manufacture, dispose. 
We've got to be thinking about when we get to the end of life of something, be it my mobile phone, the chair you're sitting on, the clothes you're wearing, whatever it is, and think of that now. Maybe it's no good as a chair or a mobile phone, but it's still full of resource. And the challenge is to be able to get that resource out to use it again. So back to the mobile phone. If your mobile phone can see 60-odd elements instead of 20-something, it's going to make it more difficult to process and separate. So complexity is a problem, I would argue. I think we need to be thinking again, because we tend to be, oh, you know, we get very clever, we get very, very pleased with ourselves, and we make things more and more complicated, using more and more stuff to make things more and more clever, whatever it is. I don't think that's a very uh, sensible approach, so I think there does need some rethinking there. Briefly, technologies we're playing with, we're looking at, so for example, I mentioned landfill sites. What can you use to get resources out of landfill sites? So imagine this is a landfill site. You could use plants. Plants are known. They're great scavengers of stuff, like metals, for example. So we've had a project running now, in a G8-funded project with Yale and UBC in uh, Canada, and mining engineers there, looking at how we can use plants as natural scavengers of metals. And then, of course, the challenge is to get the metal back out of the plant to use it again in a useful form. And that's been something we've been doing quite a lot on. So we've actually been discovering how, for example, with something like palladium, which is, a, which is one of the elements of concern, running out rather too quickly, very useful in all sorts of processes like catalytic converters, but also something like 15% of all the pharmaceuticals manufactured today use palladium catalysis, so not to be ignored. So how do we get the palladium out of uh, mine tailings and other waste streams? Well, there are certain plants that take up really high concentrations of palladium, up to 50% by weight. Amazing. The plants die. It's very good of them, actually, to take up this plant and then sacrifice themselves for us. But anyway, so we then take the plant and we process the plant containing the metal to give us, for example, a catalyst, since palladium is used so much in, in catalysts. And we find it works fairly well, so we can get very nanoparticulate metals, which have got very small sizes. And then when we use them as catalysts, we find they're pretty good, could be better, this is looking at things like willow, uh, as a, for example, as a very good scavenger of palladium. But you can tell the activity is fading away with time, so it's not perfect. We can capture the palladium, we can capture it in a very active form, but keeping it stable is still an issue to be, to be resolved. But I mentioned that I've got a real thing about food, well, what I call food supply chain waste, from farm to fork. Because everybody talks about food waste, and it's like, you know, it is a, an emotive issue. I can talk about food waste any, anywhere to anybody because, you know, it's an issue. People can relate to it and they yes, it's terrible, isn't it? I throw half my loaf away every week and, you know, whatever it is, you know, all the stuff is being thrown away at the back of my Tesco. Yeah, okay. But actually, when you go upstream in terms of, you know, from farming all the way through the processing industries, as I've done, it's very interesting to see just how much waste there is and what that waste is, and what it can be used for. So, for example, two weeks ago, I was in Turkey for the harvesting, the citrus harvest, when they were actually harvesting uh, oranges and lemons and limes and so on, and then followed a piece of fruit from the actual tree all the way to the process, to the concentrate of the juice that's sold mostly over here, and actually saw the different waste streams and so on. So you can do this for almost any type of food and see just where the wastes are. And one of the biggest challenges about any kind of waste valorization type project is, okay, how much is there, where is it, and what's it being used for at the moment? So we're doing an awful lot of mapping. This is just some snapshot data. We've got a website that shows you much more about this, but you can basically say, okay, in Europe, for example, we don't, okay, we do grow a fair amount of, uh, you know, we grow wheat straw, so UK generates about six million tons a year of wheat straw which, by the way, is still less than the amount of biomass Drax is going to be burning in a couple of years. Um, but there's all sorts of other things as well. So we've got various types of starchy waste, and we've got all sorts of, uh, well, the post-manufacturing food waste, 34 million tons a year is an awful lot. Use cooking oil, people have heard about, for making biodiesel and so on. Citrus waste in Spain. Actually, citrus waste in the UK. So not far from where I live in York, there's a factory that actually processes and makes their uh, orange uh, flavored stuff and orange juice and so on. And they throw away 50,000 tons a year of uh, orange peel. So, you know, it's not just where they grow stuff, it's where they process stuff. And that's all over the world. When you do go to all over the world, when you go to a place like Brazil, Brazil is amazing because they're almost 400 million tons of the stuff that's left after they've got the sugar out and all sorts of other stuff. I mean, everything grows well in Brazil. Africa, 
Cocoa pods, 20 million tons a year. Asia, 25 million tons a year burns in open fields in Vietnam. And now the Chinese government admitted 175 million tons of rice straw burned illegally in open fields. 175 million tons. That's a lot of carbon. That's a lot of carbon. You know, apart from the obvious uh, pollution implications of burning it in open fields, if they could capture that, car use that carbon, organic carbon, in a constructive way to substitute petroleum and so on, that could be fantastic. So the potential for utilizing all this is fantastic. And the total volumes, the UN reckons that these are the numbers, over a billion metric tons of edible waste, probably two or three times that amount of inedible food waste. This last year was the European year against food waste. It kind of initiated lots of stuff that we're doing. We need to do a lot more. But it's, it's a movement. So, for example, in two weeks, three weeks, I'll go to South Africa, and the Western Cape government there has actually got a food waste policy now, and they're looking at uh, mapping. They're looking at how they could... So very similar to this. So all over the world now, people are beginning to take this sort of thing seriously, which is, which is great news. So, you know, why food supply chain waste? Because you can make so many things. Just gives you an idea about the things you could make. All going into what we call the biorefinery, biomass, processing, biochemical, chemical, whatever, to make various things, to make all sorts of products that we have. We know we can make all these. The challenge is to make them in larger volumes, make them more efficiently, make them more economically viable, and so on. And one of our favorites is this. This is the Orange Peel Exploitation Company, because the world needs a new OPEC. So... <coughs> What's that about? Sorry, I know. When we first, we first submitted a paper for publication in this area, one of the referees wrote back and said, Professor Clark may find this title amusing. I do not. I thought, yes, right. I've won. Yes, fantastic. This is the new OPEC, yeah. So it's all, this actually came from a PhD. It was a PhD student who actually had this original idea, and it's fantastic. And basically, we recognize that people know this. It's been there for a long time. When you squeeze an orange, there's more than half the weight left. And this weight contains all sorts of interesting chemical goodies like limonene, flavonoids, pectin, sugars, and so on. And it's quite easy to really get that value out. So we, our preferred technology is using microwaves, but there are different ways to do it. We like microwaves because it's very energy efficient. It's kind of food grade. It does a simultaneous conversion of the peel into all sorts of different chemicals. But, you know, this gives you huge potential for making all sorts of chemicals. Here's some chemical structures for the chemists among you. So basically, you can make all sorts of interesting molecules, and then from those, you can make even more molecules, and you end up being able to make plastic intermediates and catalysts and solvents and all sorts of stuff. Really interesting. And we took one of those things, limonene, that people know about, and used it as a solvent for doing some very common organic reactions for the pharmaceutical industry, who, as I said, desperately need to improve the efficiency of what they were doing. That got us thinking about solvents. Solvents is one of the biggest. People don't talk so much about solvents, and yet... Solvents are huge. You know, they really are enormous. I mean, the volumes of solvents, 20 million tons a year. The pharmaceutical industry uses huge amounts of those, but so do many others like coatings and so on. Almost all of the ones we use today are based on petroleum. Many of them have all sorts of issues, atmospheric damage, but also toxicity to humans and so on. All sorts of reasons we need to do better when it comes to solvents. So we've been playing around with something we call our Sustainable Solvent Selection Service, just to give you a case study of the approach we're using to try and help people who want to find something to replace what they currently do. Substitution, but intelligent substitution. This is just detail about how we actually work with the client to come up with a better understanding as to what they need the solvent for, and then look to find a greener alternative. And so, for example, these are common organic solvents used a lot by the pharmaceutical industry. And they are now subject to almost certainly they'll be at least restricted, possibly close to banned under reach and similar legislation. So we're working now to find a greener um, solution to this. And we've got a company we're working with in Australia, but now also in the UK, who basically take waste cellulose and convert that into a molecule called sirene that we identified as being a possible solvent. And we've now shown it is a very good solvent. And they've just got a big grant to build a production facility in southern Australia for the first one of these. So hopefully it's moving in the right direction. It is possible to make intelligent substitution for chemicals that we currently use that we shouldn't be using and which legislation is telling us we shouldn't be using. But it needs to be intelligent and not just a random choice of something just because it's not on some blacklist. As I said, we like our microwave technology. What we do is we use continuous microwave processing. So we have microwaves that go from this size to as big as this room. 
where we're processing stuff, stuff, literally anything, I mean, you know, all sorts of, all the sort of food waste types I showed you. We've probably tried, uh, we've probably tried most of those. And when we take those different waste streams, we can, valor, we can get chemical extractions which can then be used for all sorts of different things, as I showed you before. Just cellulose itself. If you compare what you can do with microwaves compared to conventional methods, you get much higher yields of fermentable sugars. And that's something we're getting very excited about at the moment. We believe we can now take waste streams directly in a microwave, make stuff you can then ferment to make chemicals. And that's something you hopefully will read a lot more about over the next few months. And that means, of course, when it comes to bio-waste, all the different types of food supply chain waste, forestry waste, paper waste, all these bio-wastes at the moment, our technology tends to be based around acid treatment. Acid treatment, of course, gives you all sorts of waste issues, salt waste and so on. And then you end up with some very valuable products, especially the bio-alcohols. But the microwave technology is a possible alternative which allows you to be quicker, that's acid-free, so there's no salt waste and can give you more products. So you can actually end up making other things like waxes for cosmetics and polishes and so on, the limonene type thing I mentioned before, and many other chemicals as well to really grow the volume of the future bioeconomy, which of course so many people are talking about at the moment. And moving towards the biorefinery with something like wheat straw, for example, we do very well in the UK and most of Europe. You can imagine extracting chemicals using one green technology processing the residues to make more chemicals to make energy products so you make solid fuels there basically biochar that can go back in the soil or could be burned for power generation which is what's going to happen whether we like it or not in terms of future power stations so people are burning more and more biomass when they burn biomass they're left with ashes these ashes contain chemical goodies again so rather than think of them as being a problem let's think of them about it being an opportunity <coughs> So we can extract silicates from the ashes from burning biomass like wheat straw and makes porous silicas that can be used as catalyst supports. They can also be used to extract metals. And they could also be used to make uh, adhesives. So this is furniture we've had made in China, working with B&Q, you all know, taking all sorts of different waste streams, but using also a waste-based binder. So the whole thing is genuinely green and sustainable. Um, and this is looking very promising for kitchens. So hopefully in the future, your future kitchen cabinet will be made from basically agricultural waste processed in the right way. You can make higher value things. We have our own star bonds, which are porous solids made from food waste. I won't dwell on this. All sorts of interesting physical properties. They can be used for trapping dyes, for environmental remediation. They can also, back to my original point about metals, they can also be used to trap metals. So this is what happens when you take some of that ash from burning biomass, which is full of metals. And these metals at the moment are a waste problem. But something like the Starbond technology will pull out certain metals. We're not exactly sure why, but it takes out lithium, chromium, nickel. So it takes out some of the metals that actually are particularly valuable from those mixtures to be used further on. And one last sort of pseudo-technical thing, which uh, you know, I, I can't underestimate, even though it's incredibly boring, in that standards, because you know, the word of standards is very boring, but it's really important that we standardize, because at the moment you can call something bio-based if one molecule comes from a bio-based source, which is ridiculous. We've got to get these things tightened up. The customer has to be confident that when I say I've got a bio-based solvent, it genuinely is bio-based. And they can read about, you know, what was the resource, how was it processed, this sort of stuff. That's necessary. And that's happening now in Europe and hopefully will happen around the world a bit later. So the standards world is catching up and I think is really, really important. And we'll consider, I hope, more than just carbon. Because I've already implied we have to be thinking about more than carbon as we go forward if we really are going to make the whole thing sustainable. Just briefly ending up by just saying about who we are at York. Obviously, we're doing research, lots of industrial collaboration, education, networking. Uh, this is showing, this is our new building we moved into last year. This is an example of one of the bigger apparatus. This is our 30 kilo per hour microwave processor. So you can see that's a hopper. We feed the biomass in there. Then it goes through here with a screw feed. And what you can't see here actually is a whole series of separations to take out the solid, the gaseous, and the liquid products for further downstream processing. So that's just one example of what we have, what we call the Biorenewables Development Center, which is a scale-up lab, basically, uh, which, you know, I was just in one earlier looking at your CCS unit, and this is for processing biomass, mostly, is what we do in our unit. We have a network, so the food waste I was talking about before, we have a big European network, which anybody can join. It's got over 200 partner labs across Europe, 
and now well over 30 countries, including now outside of Europe, Brazil, South Africa, Argentina, Hong Kong, and several others. EU biz, bio-waste industrial symbiosis. An MSC. Well, you've got your MRES. We've got an MSC. And we also, of course, begin to outreach. So we, our mascot's a frog, of course, bound to be. He's green. Very smart frog. Always wearing his tie. And this is actually uh, Jenny, the only graduate so far who's been brave enough to wear the frog outfit. So, you know, so Jenny's still with us. <laughs> She spent two years in Brazil uh, doing all sorts of interesting things there, now back with us. This was a couple of years ago when she had this. This project was sponsored by Boots, uh, and this is all about trying to interact with kids and help them to understand, in the case of something like a shampoo, you know, what's in a shampoo? Where do these chemicals come from? How are they processed? And where will they go afterwards? And just briefly, locally at York, we have a big thing called BioVail, which is going to be trying to capture all the stuff I've talked about and more bring industry in to kind of work with us to really take some of these ideas further forward. And hopefully this will be confirmed and go ahead for later this year. And internationally, we have this thing called the Global Network of Green Chemistry Centers, which is brand new, and it's trying to get centers of uh, interest in green chemistry all over the world talking to each other because, you know, I often get approached by, like recently in Tanzania and Cape Town, South Africa, keen to set up new green chemistry centers. Well, actually, there's lots going on around the world where there's already centers, several people working on green chemistry, doing education as well as research and industrial collaboration. And this just is a communication vehicle to allow these people to talk because, you know, what they do in India is quite different to what they do in Thailand and in Korea, but they're all doing green chemistry, thinking about local resources, thinking about local markets, thinking about the challenges they might have with regards to waste issues and so on, all working together to hopefully progress the kinds of things I've just been talking about. Good. Thank you very much. No, no, be naive, please, because it... <laughs> Okay. The biggest one I've seen operating six tons per hour, okay. uh, which is kind of a rotating drum to allow good mixing and stuff. I have seen on paper a 20 ton per hour. I haven't seen it built. Um, and that's in the UK, by the way, um, which actually moves around the back of a lorry. The six ton per hour is being transported around the back of a lorry. Um, and I think there's one now in Canada. Uh, working on wood waste, six, again, similar scale, six-ish tons per hour. So, yeah, it is scalable. Sorry? No, like a lot of scale, but it actually seems to get better. Um, well, so I'm assured by, I mean, the one at the six ton per hour one I've seen was designed by, it was two, the two guys that set up the company, one was the ex-Nestle research director, and of course, microwaves and food industry is very common, and the other one was the former um, chief chemist for British Coal. So we knew all about energy. So, you know, I kind of had confidence they knew what they were doing. Um, and they talked about, for example, that 20, 15, 20% of what they produced was enough to, to power the whole thing. So it was, you know, it was self-sufficient, if you like, in terms of uh, resource. So it all seems to be good. And there's a French company called Serum. And they make, they make enormous, they can make a microwave of all sorts of scale. And they, certainly for drying and food processing, they have enormous microwaves. I heard of one in the US which apparently is a mile long, I, uh, which sounds like, what, you know, but I, that's what I've heard. I've never seen it, but, sorry? That's just a little one. That's a baby one, yeah. Well, of course, in America, everything's big. I know that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably in your backyard, isn't it? Yeah, hi. I was kind of bigger than that, that's so better. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you recycle this material, break it down into components, etc. I assume this is not 100%, so you still have waste. Yes. What do you do with that? Well, it, if, okay. well, this goes back to what I was saying before, for example, about the road industry. It's recognizing, it's understanding more about who can take these different... So, like, you know, classically, we talked about this over lunch. Biomass processing nowadays, most people doing this, making second-generation bioethanol, whatever, 
will say they have lignin as a waste product. On the other hand, you've got a, a, a massive industry that needs aromatics worried about future supply. So the ideal would be those two combined together. But at the moment, of course, the lignin is being used for, actually, it does go into roads to some extent. Some of it's being burned for energy. Um, so, you know, it's, I, 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 the dream, of course, is to have 100% efficient by refineries, use everything. Um, and, you know, when we typically use a microwave technology, for example, we did a lot of work with the Carbon Trust, and it was all mass balance stuff, and it was saying, well, okay, you make about 10% gases, they could be used to drive the turbine, so that's fine. You can make, it, it's adjustable how much solid product and how much liquid, the liquids are the valuable bits that contain the chemicals. Uh, the amount of solid you get, the char, varies, but let's say around a third, maybe, typically. Um, that is, I think, well, there is, there is potential, some people talk about as a soil enhancer, because obviously there's a big worry about soil erosion and stuff. And the other one, of course, is for co-firing. The power stations are burning huge amounts of biomass. Uh, and the calorific value of what comes out of the microwave, well, we just, first time we did a scale-up, we discovered it because it came out of the microwave and burst into flames. The calorific value is about 70 to 80 percent of coal, so it's high. So there's already an interesting possibility there about using it. Hi. Hi. Uh, question about the plants possibly um, taking in the, the metals. Metal. Sure, sure. Um, is there analysis being done alongside that around um, whether or not those specific plants are invasive species for that specific area? Right. Uh, I mean, to be frank with you, it's still probably too early for that. I mean, what we're doing is we're trying to identify, well, I mean, I'm not a plant scientist, so we've got plant scientists working with us. And what they're doing is they're identifying the species which are capable of taking up. We're try the ideal plant for us would be something that takes up high concentrations of metal and quite selectively. So, you know, in terms of, okay, then if you have the plant, you've obviously got to be thinking about, is this going to be, is it going to work in a certain area? So, as I mentioned to you, I'm in South Africa soon, um, where there's huge metal waste in the mine tailings. And we are now actually taking local natural plants, uh, local plants, to see what they're doing. I mean, the idea would be we can use one of those that's already doing it. And I guess it's learned to survive because of the conditions in doing it. Um, but we are also, as I say, in parallel, looking for the plants that naturally, that take up the largest concentrations. I'm not suggesting they will always be suitable for certain environments, but it's a learning curve. And it's still quite research orientated. So, um, uh, so I, I take your point, um, and uh, I'm hoping our plant biology friends are also very aware of this, and we don't get too carried away. But um, we are looking, as I say, at natural local plants in areas where there are high concentrations of metal in the waste stream. But things like landfill sites, um, some of which are quite new, I mean relatively new anyway, there probably aren't natural plants which have kind of t learned how to live with this high level of metal pollution. So that's going to be more challenging as to how you deal with them. So I hear what you're saying. Um, and it will figure in our, in our future plans, but it's quite early yet, really. Hi. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just around the corner from us. So, I mean, linked, as in they're, they're our neighbours. So we know them well, yes. Right. Hmm. It's actually, that's, that's wrong. We, most of our microwave processing is below 200. Is it? Yeah. You'd be amazed. <laughs> <coughs> okay. The guys here are on solar. All right. The idea of generating very high temperatures, but uh, obviously, if we can generate successfully very high temperatures, then we can have some of the lower temperatures from some of the processing we do at very high temperatures for powering that process. Now, there's nothing special about the microwave. It's just a fuel efficient way of getting it to 200. Well, it's also, I mean, a microwave is a very, very efficient way of getting the energy into the right. material. I mean, you're not, it's not crucial what frequency you're using the microwave. 
no, 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 no. Yeah. So if you need 200 to 250, then possibly we can give it to you from a waste stream from a higher temperature solar. Oh, that would be interesting. We, yeah, a lot of, I mean, actually, we've done a lot of work on trying to figure out what the temperature, what, what cellulose softens at 184 degrees. And that's exactly the temperature which the microwave starts to have an effect. So there is a, there is a nice, uh, so, you know, once we're at that temperature, then cellulose starts to do stuff. And it will char unless you, you know, if you let it. Yes. Um, that we should simplify our processes and sort of My opinion. Design, yeah. designing for recycling. Yes. And I was wondering if you can sort of see any scenario in which companies might be, might start doing that of their own initiative or is that something we're always going to have to be using sort of Well the price of metals of course, I mean okay there's all sorts of hiccups because of the recession, but the general trend was that yeah. a lot of these metals the price was going up. Indium I can't, went, went up by a factor of 10 or something over a fairly short period of time. So the reality, the, the good old <coughs> price reality, should affect them. And I just wonder, and one of my I crazy ideas is whether there's going to be some kind of taxation or, uh, or even some kind of rationing, you know, because as I say, if you look at the trends for Europe, it's very worrying. Europe's very nervous about having to rely on, you know, South Africa, China, Russia as supplies for a lot of its critical elements. So, um, you know, so a reaction, one reaction to that could be a form of rationing in some way. So um, I think there could be some government pressures on these companies to be more. And also, well, yeah, I guess to, so either they're going to get the things back again by, I mean, you know about the WE legislation, the waste electronic and, uh, legislation. Now, I think, you know, in the ideal world, that would include the companies taking the resource and getting the back again. But that hasn't, to the best of my knowledge, happened very well. Um, but that's, that's what you need them to do, because they're probably the best people to... I mean, in the, in the world of chemical catalysis, you see, people like Johnson Matthey, it's quite common now to talk about leasing catalysts. So if you want to use palladium as a catalyst, you can lease it from the company. And then you give the waste back to them, because they're probably the best people to know how to process and get the value back again. So the leasing thing is already happening. And, you know, maybe in the future when you buy a mobile phone, it's a leasing thing. You will get, you have to give it back or you get penalised if you don't, you get credit. And they, then the company has to be seen to be putting it back in to its manufacturing processes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I sat, so I had a meeting yesterday with a guy from Biz, and he was saying that, uh, just saying to mention this at lunchtime as well, that they're hoping pre-Purda, because we're almost at Purda Day, so in other words, you know, nothing will happen soon because of the election, but he, he hopes that by within two weeks, there will be the first um, formal report coming from the government in reaction to the House of Lords study on, on bio-wastes. Um, and landfill sites should be figured in there. But I don't know. I haven't seen this yet. I was promised to have a look at it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I know that Belgium, uh, they had an official opening of a landfill site. I couldn't get to it. One of my guys went to it. Um, I, I think the they... Gas Sorry? That was the gas system. I don't know. I, didn't, I wasn't there. But they, I know there was an official opening. Um, one of my guys went there, and there wasn't... They, I'm not sure they're going to do anything, but they're certainly... Because um, there was one in... in Oh, I see. Working on a Belgium, one of the big Belgian uh, landfill sites, so it's getting 200,000 households electricity. This was all energy, right, okay. I don't think it was that one, because right. I was told this was more to do with actually looking at it from the point of view of mining for resources. Yes, that was going to happen first. Okay, then, so all right, logic, okay. Mine for resources and then use what you, yeah. you can't get in the yeah. out of. Uh, but with this very high temperature, you're getting very, very good uh, returns because of the high, very high temperature. Okay, high that sounds reasonable. I mean, I went to what I was told was the most advanced landfill site in Europe, which is in the south of Spain, near Cordoba. Uh, and I was taken on a tour there, and that was really interesting because, I mean, they weren't doing anything really clever, but the psychology there, they were talking about them being a factory and the waste is being their feedstock, and they were talking about the products. And, 
Yeah, none of the products were that clever. A lot of it was just separating and sed selling off, but they reckon half, more than half of what came in went out again. So I like that because it was a very positive attitude towards what they were doing. Um, and if you could just add something a bit more clever, which could be the energy side you're talking about, but of course ideally to satisfy some of these issues, there's got to be a resource yeah. element in there. Uh, not officially, but we will be, yes. Yeah. So we, have, we, have, we have connections in too. Yeah, there's a lot going on now. I think, as I say, the circular economy thing is, is picked up really, really quickly, which is, which is interesting. Um, and there's also, you know, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which... Yes, um, exactly. Yes, I mean... I've, yeah, yes, 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 they are. So there's, there's a lot of people talking about it, and um, I'm just keen to see the kind of technology keeping up with it, or matching the expectations because uh, a lot of it's still what I would call kind of first generation yeah. thinking. You know, people get very excited about AD. I mean, I've been to various, I've been to a couple of farms in Yorkshire where they've actually, I mean, one farmer I met had spent over a million pounds on building an AD plant, which he wasn't very happy with because it was barely returning on investment. But it was, you know, okay, it's AD, it's something. I suppose it's better than nothing, but it still seemed to me like a, a waste. Are they? Uh, yes. So again, high temperatures get right. more out of storage. It's very Right. I know Yorkshire, because funny enough, one of my guys was talking about meeting with Yorkshire yeah, Water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't necessarily follow that we'd be the first yeah, they talked to, but, anyway, but I am aware that Yorkshire, they're taking it more seriously. That's interesting. And the other people, very interested. more than pretty well all the water industry combined, I think, on research and development. They weren't for a while, but they seem to have changed their tune recently, which is good to see. There's also, I mean, another interesting sign I saw very recently was Drax, Europe's largest coal-fired burnt, not far from uh, where we are. And for years, we've been banging on their door saying, can you do more than just burn stuff, please? And actually, I sat in a meeting just last week, and one of the senior Drax guys actually for the first time said, maybe we should be thinking about this. Because, of course, they've got the infrastructure set up. They're going to be burning 8 million tons of biomass a year very soon, which, of course, they're bringing in from all over the world, which is crazy, I think. But anyway... So let's, if they have all this biomass, can we please, please, please think about more than just burning it? So people at least are beginning to recognize there's, you know, a bit more than just the simple stuff before. So there's some encouraging signs, yes.